Yo, 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 what is going on, COD Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and today we have a treat for you. So we're going to be going over the newly released, which was shortly after the dev feedback December suggestions that we did in the second to last video. And now we have the developer Q&A, which is different than the feedback, and this is part six. So we're going to be reading you this top down. And then I'm going to give you my thoughts. And it's interesting because if you looked at the number of downvotes and we'll just say kind of, I don't want to say ne maybe not negative, but uh, disfavoring reactions to the uh, dev feedback for the December suggestions, you're noticing there's a little bit of consistency, right? That's happening here, at least for some, at least for some, right? We'll say. Here we go. Top down. Uh, we have, uh, recently there have been some changes in the game that were not mentioned in any announcements. Will you make sure that announcements notify players of all changes before we notice them ourselves? Uh, answer, we've always maintained that changes should never be hidden from players. We recently found that communication between various internal teams was not optimal, resulting in some changes being omitted from announcements, and we'd like to extend our sincerest apologies for this. Okay. Moving forward, we will track all changes more carefully, improve the flow of information between and among our teams, and increase the level of transparency with players so that this communication failure doesn't happen again. That's a big one. We also welcome your continued feedback during this process. Okay, this to me is pretty straightforward. Where you get the reasoning, you get what the plan is, and then the promise of it not happening again, right? And... It, it, again, I, I can somewhat understand this for working in some, some for some companies that I have where you'll have at times changes that are made and sometimes internal teams or different departments within the company may not be internally communicating with each other to align and get onto the same page. And so I can understand this. And if they're saying, hey, this is what was happening, this is the plan we have going forward, and this is not going to happen again, where any time, regardless of the size of the change that is made, is either going to be made, is either going to be put into a patch notes announcement, or it'll be put into a separate announcement, or potentially a hotfix, right? But as long as it is always communicated, that's the ask or that's the expectation that we should all have, whether that be from the development side or from the community side. So this to me is a win. This is refreshing to hear. However, bear in mind that when you say something, and I'm just going to point this out because I'm sure we got some, some data miners out there, some, some hunters that will be on this. When you say something like this communication failure will not happen again slash doesn't happen again, best believe you're going to have community players that will be scouring Every update, especially the next update, when it comes out or any changes that happen after this announcement was made, and if something is or put into the game without proper communication, oh boy, I'm just saying, people will be looking for that opportunity. So when you say something like that, it's very easy. If a change is made, just communicate it. Bam. Then we get to number two. Will you add more difficulty levels to the Behemoth raid? What about three difficulties? Normal elite, S2 plus Behemoth. Really, what they're what really what this should be is normal elite epic, right? I think that would be a, an easier way to understand that. Thanks for your active participation and suggestions. Behemoth raids is a permanent game mode designed to allow a certain type of player to experience what it's like to fight Behemoth. Players who have never done so. Or players in alliances with low power and few opportunities for fighting. We still need to evaluate the game mode further, and we don't plan on adding more difficulty levels at the moment. We hope the current difficulty will attract more players and let them experience behemoth combat. While some players might be discouraged by more difficult or fast-paced battles, we will consider adding higher difficulties or race modes to other events, so stay tuned. Okay, there's a couple pieces here, and I think this is the one that is kind of getting some of the disfavorable reactions, is that... The normal difficulty, and we're going to do a video on this, but the normal difficulty for some of the behemoths right now, if you're looking at the S2 Plus Kingdoms, and potentially even some of the S2 Vanilla Kingdoms, is that for a number of alliances, however many that may be, they're currently just unable to capture even just the normal behemoth, right? Albeit the elite raids for those behemoths. And... This is anywhere from, you know, a couple million power up to five, six, seven million power, right, for some of the kingdoms. And these challenges only further incentivize and create a pyramid, 
function, a mega alliance structure where you're funneling players to the top because the belief is, well, we need to gather the 40 best players, 50, 60 best players, strongest players in the kingdom in order to tackle these. And that causes, at times, depending on how aggressive or conservative kingdoms that opt in for this approach will play out, can be anything from you losing alliance activity for merges to happen, which again will continue to lose alliance activity, for player drop-off to be increased partially here because of the fact that players might be looking to go towards, especially if they're strong enough, to go and join these alliances, even though the hope really, I, I think, in the big picture is that these are temporary, so you're going there just to help out, but then you have to remember, you have to remove people. If you're thinking about kingdoms in S2 and S2+, the restrictions are even the restrictions get even even more limiting. And to the point of where if you're in S2+, plus and you're at cap already, you're not going to remove people just to bring in someone that's stronger, right, to help you. Now, bear in mind, doing things like adding in home kingdoms, like we often touch on, can solve a lot of this. Because then you don't feel this need to alliance hop or to uh, join or funnel as much. Doesn't mean that it's going to eliminate it completely. But it will assist in the endeavor because you're having more of an alliance-focused approach where everything is independent. Everything is uh, separate because you don't have this kind of kingdom union or, or strong bond of community that you have within a kingdom for multiple alliances that you want to be successful, that you want to be healthy. Uh, and we're talking in, in the overall kingdom-wide approach compared to what's happening now where you have more of an alliance-focused approach going into seasons and you don't necessarily feel maybe as much loyalty to the alliance as you would if you were a part of a kingdom and a, and a group of alliances that were all there working together, especially if you're doing things like power balancing as well. These are all things that can really help. But now it's more of, oh, we just have our loyalty to our alliance. And so you just don't really have this additional layer of community and bonding that you would if you had a kingdom. So I think these are also additional factors that play into why it is that you see the trend of players and alliances going more in this direction to try and deal with being able to just beat normal and then beat elite raids for the behemoths. So to me, and we've talked about this before, I personally think the, the, uh, the best way to approach this is you adjust strength and difficulty levels of the normal and the elite behemoths to fall more in line based on what the average troop capacity or the average amount of troops that are being trained and then also the amount uh, then also the troop capacity from season to season the way that it is now they basically have a flat rate like it, it's almost like they just decided hey we're just going to think of a number in our head and we'll just come up with it and that's the number right so the example is like let's say the difficulty level is 100 right that they put for normal and the elite raid difficulty is 200. But let's say if you're factoring in the amount of troops that the average player is training each season, along with the troop capacities that start out in season one, then get increased season two and season two plus, and let's say the power average power level for that is like 75, right, or 80, if you will. Uh, and you're talking from normal, right? As things, if you're just looking at maybe like a season two plus as an example. Uh, and again, that's probably a conservative number. But the challenge is, is that that's what the behemoths are are almost in compar in comparison to, uh, if, if that may help to elicit or to explain that a little a little better. So again, that's my view on it. Uh, as far as them, I don't know if I would say. I mean, like I'm okay with them coming out with another difficulty level that doesn't necessarily impact the normal and the elite. Uh, and I, I think it's somewhat okay to think of it like that. But I think more importantly. Right, doing these, and there's factors to this as well, right? You can also say that the reason why some of the alliances may not be uh, able to capture the behemoth is more due to their organization, their structure. I mean, you have to think about it, right? Um, is, is everyone dodging behemoth skills that are being used? Do they have a game plan going in? Do they have an appropriate distribution of tank versus DPS? Are they using proper hero? pairings are do they have skill sets uh, or talent appropriate talent tree set to do behemoths uh, are they running optimal artifacts based on what those players i mean have available to them right to use on the behemoth so there's multiple things right are they all in voice you can see there's multiple factors that go into whether or not they're being successful or not 
However, I will say that even if you're basing it off the bare minimum, which is dodging behemoth skills and then maybe getting on voice and just knowing how the behemoth uh, telegraphs itself throughout the fight, if you're using that as your bare minimum, then yeah, you can maybe go and look at how many of these are being captured versus not being captured uh, based on the power, right, and the activity level. And on top of that, are you getting your strongest players from your alliance to do the raid, or are you not? So again, there's a lot that goes into this. It, it, that type of data would be, I don't know how difficult or, or not that would be to pull from the devs, but I just feel like there's a lot more that you have to look at when you're going about adjusting, aside from what I was saying about troop capacity and then how many total troops are being trained i think those are factors that should go into it but there is a lot more then we get to the next question will you increase the drop rate for treaties and settle arrows or perhaps reduce the quantity so they've already addressed this they said this in the december one that we read where they are going to be looking to increase the quantities earned in current events next question after the reset system update i feel i feel like man i feel like if i was at there, if I was at like some type of session for Call of Dragons and someone answered, I just gave them like a one sentence answer. All right, I was like, next. <laughs> yeah, it didn't mean to come. Didn't mean for it to come off that way. Uh, after the reset system update, we can't control which skills are upgraded, which wastes a lot of resources. Will this be improved? So after the V one point zero point two one update, uh, reset rule adjustment came into effect, including a partial reset of hero levels. Our aim was to accelerate hero leveling and reduce leveling across uh, leveling costs early in the season. But indeed, we overlooked the issue of skill upgrades. Skill upgrades wouldn't make skills reach the same level as in previous seasons, or at least not the main skills to address this we are considering adding a skill locking feature for example a level 30 hero could lock skills two and three and only upgrade skill one bear in mind skill one is always going to be the first to upgrade regardless i think a better example here would have been to say you can lock skills one and two and then upgrade three right um, or they could lock skill three and upgrade skills one and two um, at random right or if you're only going to allow for you to lock one skill right obviously it's still going to increase your odds uh, that way players could choose which skills to prioritize upgrading. Stay tuned for more on this. So this is nice. I think this is a good addition, right? Now they're considering skill locking. Do I really think that this is like the end-all be-all to, oh man, we need this to be in the game or people are going to riot? No, not at all. Do I think that this is and can be viewed as a nice quality of life inclusion? Yes, without a doubt. Uh, then we get to uh, the next one, which is uh, currently the limit on occupiers of villages means that some alliance members don't have a spot available to participate in the occupation. Will you increase the limit? Uh, answer, we've received feedback about this from many players, so we plan to increase the village occupation limit in January or February of next year, which is most likely when the next update will drop, so that way more players can participate. Stay tuned for update announcements to learn more. So, okay, I mean, this is okay. However... And I say this respectfully, it's still not good enough. The village system needs to be reverted back to what it was, which is that once your alliance occupies the territory and they build the road out to the village, every player in that alliance gets the buff applied to them passively. Now, if or, or at least I should say the, uh, the opportunity. Now, if you want to make some type of action-oriented uh, gating effect where you require players to still go out and attack the village, right? Where they have to do an action to get the reward or to get the passive buff. Totally, totally okay with that. I personally think that would be a healthier alternative and compromise compared to having a forced limit on how many people can get the buffs. This, as we said in the previous video, causes, unfortunately, too much strife headache and pain within alliance especially for the r5s and the r4s as 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 members of the management team so this is something that again as long as you have a limit on the amount of people that can occupy villages you're just going to be causing more unneeded stress uh to the alliance uh, management teams themselves this is something and on top of that all players want the opportunity to be able to get all of the village buffs like if you asked players and said hey would you rather everyone have access to all the village buffs but you had to do one or two actions in order to get it or would you rather have limited options on the amount of people that could get those particular buffs meaning that a number of you then the majority of you are not going to get them i mean it's a it's a no-brainer right and to be fair let's really talk about this at the root cause who was complaining about and that this is the most important thing who was complaining about how the previous system was because i'll give you an answer no one right and more specifically 
and more appropriately, there was not a majority of people that were screaming from the hilltops advocating for the way that the previous system was to be changed to what it is now. I, I again, I never saw that. Never saw one suggestion. Never, uh, sorry, one suggestion that had a healthy number of people that were advocating for this. I never once heard from anyone that I can recall and remember that were advocating for this in droves. So again, that's really what we should be addressing is where was the justification for making the change in the first place? Where was the overwhelming support? Because I just didn't see any. And I think that's important to recognize when we look at making changes is that where's the feedback coming from? Is it justified? Is there value in making the change that's going to be a net positive and not a negative? And the fact of the matter is, with respect, this one was just not. Hang on, sweetie. I'm almost done. Then when we get to the next question here, which is, will you increase the number of players that can participate in Roots of War? And how about adding new maps to Roots of War? So when we look at the, will you increase the number of players that can participate? Uh, sorry, answer here. In response to feedback on Roots of War, we have a preliminary plan for improvements, including increasing the number of participating alliances and improving the matchmaking system. These improvements should allow more players to participate, so stay tuned for announcements. Regarding new maps, we will add to our improvement plan, but there will be no changes or additions for the time being. If we plan to design a new map, we'll update you right away. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, do I think this is an okay, maybe potential Band-Aid solution? Right, We'll have to see, obviously, how this one plays out. But for me, the easy way I like to look at this is just allow for an alliance to field multiple Roots of War teams. And if there's not a way to do that internally then create a system that allows for uh, the alliance to assign multiple teams. Uh, where, for example, if you can't do it like internally, where it's, where it's, hey, assign these 40 players here, these 40 players are this team, create an external system that allows for players to maybe be assigned somewhere else or maybe join something outside of the alliance. Maybe that doesn't take them or remove them from the alliance itself, where they have to go join another one. I think this would be really... I think this would actually be a great feature if they were able to work it in or figure out some way to where you could have like maybe not an A team, B team, but like a first team, a second team, third team, or however you want to view it. Not to indicate first string, second string, third string, but doing something like that, I actually think would be a big win. Then we get to the next question, which is, are there any plans to improve the rune, uh, the runic statue event? As it is now, the side with the lower power doesn't participate much and the side with the higher power doesn't have an opponent. This makes the entire event rather boring. Okay, I'm going to say something here on the question in a moment. <laughs> Thanks for your feedback. We have preliminary plan for improving the event. The core mechanics of the event will remain unchanged for now. So the focus will be on improving the balance between sides, including adjusting the point gaining mechanics and increasing the points gained from merits and peacekeeping. By adding new ways to earn points and adjusting the point gaining mechanics, we can achieve a balanced win rate for both sides during the events. We will also reduce the number of points required to get rewards allowing the losing side to claim different tiers of rewards, thus increasing their motivation to participate. We'll provide more details in upcoming announcements, so stay tuned. Okay, so there's a few pieces here. Let's first start with I, what I think is the most important one, which is the question itself, right? Where they say the side with the lower power doesn't participate much, the side with the higher power doesn't have an opponent. I mean, this is just, respectfully, this is just obvious, right? I mean, you're just stating facts at this point. I don't think this is a reason. I don't think this is the way the question should have been worded in my opinion i understand what what they're saying but the fact is is that this can be said even in the open field for pvp right the the stronger power and the side with more activity has better chances of winning versus the side with lower power and lower activity right i mean all you're kind of doing is just stating what is however the answer they gave i thought was actually and i don't i don't know why i want to say better than the question but i think the answer was very well uh done here where they focused on how the merit points are gained, uh, or sorry, how the points are gained from merits and peacekeeping while in the zone. And like I've talked about with the Runic Statue event, I just think the, the, the area needs to be a little bit bigger. Like, increase the size by double, right? By width of the circle, and then double the size of the area for the part that's in the middle. I think two to three times is okay, but let's at least double it and see how that plays out. And then, beyond that, Right, that you have to understand that there is always going to be a level of realistic expectation here, depending on where alliances are placed. Now, 
that's the important part. This is the next part we have to look at, which is that this is nice that they're adjusting that. I think this is a nice adjustment. We'll see how that plays out. But then you have to look at the third point here, which is the bigger point, is that how kingdoms are being placed, and more specifically how alliances are being placed in the starting zone ones, heavily impact who is going to have better shots of winning going into those runic statues that's because they're allowed to freely go wherever they want and they can move wherever they want so you can create heavy imbalances at the runic statue event because of the current mechanics this isn't the fault of the developers as much as it's not the fault of the alliances that are choosing where to go i don't think alliances are, are choosing their starting zone one regions based on oh who's going to have the most favorable runic statue matchup like that's not that's not a primary or main factor thought that is going into it. It's where are we going to get uh, favorable matchups going further in the season and where are we going to set ourselves up to have allies so we don't get overrun in our zone one. Those are more important. Those are bigger impacts, not more important, but bigger impacts of how leaders and management teams are thinking when they go into place or to choose a, uh, a starting zone one region right for the new season. So this really has to be done on, you have to look farther out than this. When you're looking at how are you going to get more favorable runic fights, would you get more favorable runic fights by having more balanced KVKs? If you have more balanced KVKs and then you're getting, and then you don't have this East versus West split, like if they removed that in S2 Plus as an example, and they said, uh, we're going to go in and you three kingdoms are going to be paired up and we're going to do one, one, or like one, two, one, two, one, two then you're more likely to get more favorable matchups because you're looking to balance based on kingdom strength, based on the alliance's strength, on the activity strength. And it's just, again, it's a higher ch higher percentage chance you're going to get a more favorable matchup compared to what is being done now. Then we get to the last... Hang on, sweetie, one last question. Then we get to the last one here, which is when two equally strong alliances play against each other in S2+, turrets are so strong that there's no way to open up an advantage. Do you have any ideas to solve this problem? Don't sit on there, please. Thank you. Go put some socks on, and then, and then, I'll, and then I'll be right there to answer the question. Thank you, sweetie. So do you have any ideas to solve this problem? The original purpose of turrets was to enrich the combat experience and add a sense of suspense. Over time, we found that players don't use turrets as a supplementary support, uh, but rather that the entire battle revolves around turrets to resolve this. And to be fair, it's not necessarily that the entire battle revolves around turrets. It's that the turrets are creating a turtling effect in the game that make it so either players are potentially fearful or alliances are potentially fearful or cautious to push and or you you don't have um, enough focus on the open field because you have to get rid of all the turrets first when they're just being built in mass and really the focus should be more on the open field play and now it's, again, understanding that they really are supposed to be more of a supplementary piece, right? They're supposed to be more of an add-on, right? And an extra, if you will, and not the main attraction. Uh, then we get, right, uh, to resolve this, we will implement a round of adjustments in future updates, including reducing the number of turrets that can be built. Okay, again, this is what we talked about, right? We talked about turrets being built and then construction and destruction speed. They say reducing turret construction speed, great. Increasing turret construction cooldowns. And increasing the resource cost of building turrets, thus forcing players to use turrets only as a, as a support during battle. Again, I think for the most part, we'll have to see how this plays out. But I'm, I'm hoping that the construction and the de and, and the destruction speed will be the same. Uh, and then again, if they want to add in cooldowns, eh, I mean, do I think that might be a little bit extra? Possibly adjusting cost for the turrets. Eh, okay, maybe. Do I think that this is? Do I still think this is a net positive to see how this plays out? And then if we need to assess going further, yes, I still think this is a win for turrets, and this is great. With that in mind, that's pretty much it for me. I can't believe I'm here at 24 minutes. Let me know what you guys think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have a different viewpoint? I need to go and answer this drastic question from my daughter right now, who's tickling my neck. And yeah. That's going to be it for me. As always, until next time, I'll catch you guys later.